welcome to Functional Philosophy. I'm Charles Tu. That's T as in tango, E as in echo, and W as in whiskey. This is episode number nine, and its title is Moral Choice Systems in Video Games. Hello, today I am speaking to you without a script. Normally I write what is essentially an essay, and then read that to you with interjections here and there. Today I'm going off of a few brief notes. I hope you will gain something in sincerity and authenticity in my tone and pacing, but unfortunately what you gain in that you may lose in eloquence, unless I happen to be very good off the top of my head, which sometimes I am. Let's just hope sometimes includes today. I'd appreciate feedback on this episode, whether you prefer me speaking off the cuff like this or whether you prefer my more planned out episodes. It doesn't have to be either or. I can go back and forth. I enjoy doing it both ways. Normally, I talk to myself a lot. I just pace around and essentially give extemporaneous lectures on all of these topics, so I figured, why should I let the void be the only beneficiary of my speaking? I should just turn on a microphone and record. So that's what I'm doing here. So today is going to be a video game episode. I don't know how many of you are into video games, but I think this episode will be valuable even if you're not into them, because this episode is going to deal more fundamentally with morality, with the value of morality in real life, with its presentation in art. I already have notes on an episode on the incomparable and misunderstood power of morality. But for now, I'm going to talk about moral choice systems in games. So what is a moral choice system? Well, if you're not familiar, a moral choice system is just what it sounds like. In certain games, you play as a character and you get to make choices. And usually these choices are given a moral edge. It's, it's They're not preferences. They're taken to have some kind of moral implications. There are basically two schools of moral choice systems in games. The more traditional school is the binary moral choice system school. In this school, you are presented with a choice, choice A and choice B. Choice A, let's say, is good, choice B is bad. Now you choose one of those things, you proceed, progress in the game, and you come up against another choice, choice A and choice B. Now choice A is also good, and choice B is also bad. I mean, the second choice A is also good, and the second choice B is also bad. The choice A, every choice A, falls along an axis, and the same with B. It's a bipolar system. You have two polarities, and all A's are integrated into one principle. All B's are integrated into one principle. And so you know that your choice A, in any given case, is manifesting the same principle throughout the game. So that's the first kind of system you see. And that's pretty common. It used to be more common. The second kind of system is the case-by-case -case moral system. You're presented with a choice. You're given two or more options. You can be given more than two options in the binary model, too. I just use binary for simplicity. But there can be two, three, maybe four, but it has to be severely delimited if the designers are going to integrate the choices on an axis. But for the case-by-case -case school, you're presented with an array of choices, you pick one, you move forward, you're presented with another choice, but none of these choices integrate with any of the previous choices. Each choice is case-by-case. -case. There is no integration. There's no good axis, there's no bad axis. It's just this choice, Choose what you think's best here. You come up against another choice, choose what you think's best here. No principles, no integration, no connections. Now, people hate binary 
moral choice systems. At least that's if the internet is anything to go by. You have massive criticism of that kind of system and massive praise of the case-by-case system. Now, why do people hate binary moral choice systems? They hate them because principles are unreal to them. I once heard a criticism that said, when you choose the right choice in these, he was talking about one particular game, but he said, when you choose the right choice, the good choice consistently in this game, everything works out in the end. It's like your protagonist has some kind of prescience. He just knows what's going to happen. He always knows it's going to work out for the best. That's so unrealistic. But that is the purpose of morality. Morality is a guide to action. The whole point of morality is to enable you to predict the future. Not necessarily in detail, but in principle. It's like throwing a rock up in the air. You may not be able to predict exactly where it's going to fall, but you know it is going to fall. And you can predict within a pretty narrow range, depending on how you decide to throw it. The same thing is true with morality. If you take good actions, you can expect good results. People don't have this view of morality because to them, morality is something disconnected from action. It's disconnected from consequences. You take an action, a moral action, because you have a duty to, come what may. So you have, you, you have no right to any expectations when you take a moral action because morality is something that's just, it has nothing to do with our world, with our lives. It's just this otherworldly obligation. So people think games that express a positive view of taking moral actions are unrealistic. They also think the choices are boring. They'll say, they'll use an example like, and this kind of example does come up. You come up to an orphanage and your choice is donate money to the orphanage or slaughter all the orphans inside and steal what little money they have. And they say, this is a boring, it's good, it's bad, it's black and white. There's no interesting choice here. Everybody knows what's good and bad. This is, again, this integrates with their otherworldly view of morality. You don't discover morality from facts. There's no interesting questions about morality. Everybody knows what morality is. You get it from the Bible. Altruism is good. Selfishness is bad. How do you know that? You just know it. That's what everybody says. So it's not interesting. You know what's good, you know what's bad, it's not making any interesting statement. On the other hand, they love these case-by-case systems. Why? Because it gets out of this moral obviousness. The kind of choice they love is, the orphanage is burning down. Half the children are on one side, half the children are on the other side. Which side do you choose to save? You can only save one. Now that, to them, is an interesting question. It's not simplistic. Oh, you have these principles that boil everything down to being good or bad. That's so simplistic. That's not how the world works. This is an interesting question. How do you decide this question? Well, the more perfectly balanced it is, the harder it is to decide. In fact, it's impossible to decide because there's no standard by which to judge. But that's what they think is complex. That's what they think is interesting, but it isn't interesting. The only way you can solve that problem is you go in and you do some kind of subjective, arbitrary weighing. You look at every individual child and you try to add them up and say, well, this side of the orphanage will give (laughs) slightly more social utility points to the world then this side, so I'll save that side. That is taken to be complicated. That is taken to be interesting. That is taken to be real. But it isn't real. It's pointless. It isn't interesting. It's not generalizable. It has no implications for any other choices in the game, let alone real life. The harder the question is to answer, the more interesting they think it is. But the secret is, the question has no answer. And when a question has no answer, it isn't interesting, it's boring and pointless. It's like if someone asked you, what does 2 plus 2 equal if it doesn't equal 4? Well, now it's supposed to be really interesting and deep and complex to think, hmm, well, would it be 3? 
because three is the next number down, or would it be five because five is the next number up, the next greatest number? So should you go down or up if you can't, if the answer isn't four? Hmm. Or maybe it's 444 because that has four a bunch of times, or 4,444 because that has four, four times. You see how inane this is. It's pointless. There is no answer if you're not allowed to give the right answer or if there just is no answer. It's not interesting, you're not figuring anything out if you're banging your head against a wall trying to figure out the answer to a question that has no answer. But that's the only kind of question they want to deal with. You know, this relates to that trite idea that as soon as you know the answer to something, you lose your curiosity, you become dogmatic, you stop looking for answers. So really, knowledge is the enemy of the intellect. It's the enemy of curiosity. It's the enemy of investigation. But that is wrong. Knowledge is why you are curious. Knowledge is the end of investigation. Knowledge is why you are investigating. You investigate, you ask questions because you want knowledge. So the truth is the opposite. You investigate in the first place because you know there are answers because you expect to be able to get answers. If you thought a question was never answerable, that the case could never be closed, you'd never start investigating. Why ask the question if it can't be answered? So this whole endless skepticism, that is not an ally of the intellect of curiosity. So this whole idea that the quickest way to block your mind off from the truth is to think you've got the answer. That is specious. That is garbage. Don't fall for that. Now, why are binary moral choice systems good? Well, it's true that sometimes you get oversimplified, superficial implementations of this system or content attached to this system, but this is the same principle that's been at play throughout history when you have you know, classicist styles of teaching, and it's just this rationalistic, top-down, we're going to give you the answers. It is empty. It is superficial. It's still more valuable than a question that can't be answered, because at least it's some answer without... I mean, it doesn't have any reasoning attached, but a dogmatic answer is more valuable than no answer. But binary choice systems are capable of being good because... They make a statement, a cause and effect statement, an identification of cause and effect. They say, if you take this kind of action, you can expect this kind of result. That's interesting. That allows you to integrate your choices within the game. And in real life, your choices are generalizable, or the information, the feedback you get from your choices is generalizable. It's applicable to more than just the choice you made right then. Binary systems are also the only systems that allow game developers to come up with satisfying endings, satisfying conclusions. If you have a binary system, or a system with only a few axes, then the developers have put their own interpretation of your actions into the game. So they know what it means when you've chosen a certain kind of action consistently, and they can write an ending in line with that. Compare that to the case-by-case -case system. The developer has no idea what thread of logic you've used to string along all of your choices throughout the game. They have no idea how you've rationalized and connected all your choices, what reasoning you're using, what principle you're going on. That exists only in your mind. So the developers can't create a satisfying ending because they don't know what logic you were using. So games like that invariably have uninteresting, superficial, and usually non-variable endings. Now, Mass Effect is the best example of a binary moral choice system because it has two axes, what it calls Paragon and what it calls Renegade. Paragon is the principled, long-term, and usually altruistic kind of action. Renegade is the pragmatic, short-term, usually allegedly selfish kind of action. 
A Paragon character might chase a bad guy to his apartment or tail a bad guy to his apartment and then say, well, I know he has evidence in there and I know he's destroying it, but I can't just bust in without a warrant. I know that the principle of privacy is worth more than catching this one bad guy right now. Now, the renegade choice would be just bust down the door, get that evidence. Why follow these abstract rules? They're not helping in reality. I know this guy's guilty. Why should I not go in and get him if I know he's guilty? Now, what's great is the game makes no obvious statement about which is good and which is bad, aside from the results that come from taking a certain kind of action. Previous games by this developer were much... They were in the Star Wars universe. Light side, dark side, good, bad. The goodness is just intrinsic there. It's obvious. But in Mass Effect, it's not good and bad. It's principled versus pragmatic. And the way they get morality into the game is by showing you what principled action leads to and what pragmatic action leads to. And their ultimate point is that evil consists of nothing more than being pragmatic. In reality, gray is not defensible. Gray is not mixed. Gray is black. Or rather, it is mixed, but that's all black can ever be. You can't be consistently black. So to be black, to be evil, is to be gray. Or rather, to be gray is to be black. You don't get out of it. You don't get to say, well... I'm some good, some bad. No, that's what being bad is. It's being some bad, because you can't be fully bad. So Mass Effect is far and away the best implementation of a moral choice system ever done, as far as I've seen, and I've played a lot of these games. It's not oversimplified, but it's not pseudo-complex. It makes a statement, it, it allows you to generalize on the basis of your actions, but it doesn't tell you what's good and bad. It lets you figure it out based on the consequences, the cause and effect relationships that they built into the game based on their understanding of the world. That's great. I love that. Now, why don't people love that? Well, most people have what I think of as dog psychology. People who enjoy that kind of disintegrated choice system where everything is disconnected from everything else. Have the mentality of a dog. I don't know if you've ever had a dog, but I had dogs growing up. And whenever my parents would leave for work, the dog would run to the window, look out the window, and just watch. As they drove away down the road, the dog would just watch and continue to watch. And it would sometimes come back to the window and just watch. And it wasn't bored. It was tense. You know, if you poked its back, it would, you know, be startled. Because it, was, it just had rapt attention on what was going on outside that window. Now, you as a human being, or I as a human being, knew my parents weren't coming back anytime soon. But the dog had no idea. The dog really had the status of knowledge that anything could happen in the next moment. It had no basis by which to judge whether my parents would just immediately come back home. It didn't know what was going on, so it had no idea what to expect. For the dog, looking out that window, every second was like playing the lottery. Every second was like pulling the lever on a slot machine. Anything could happen in that next second, so it never got bored. I mean, I don't get bored when I pull the lever on a slot machine. Each time you could get triple sevens and win a ton of money. That's fun. But that's exactly how the dog thinks of it, looking out the window, waiting for its owner to come back home. And that is exactly how people who like this case-by-case, disintegrated way of designing moral choice systems, that's how they think of the world. That's the pleasure they get. They have a disintegrated mindset. To them, cause and effect, there is no cause and effect. They're like the dog. They don't understand all the variables involved. It's too complex. So for them, anything might happen when you choose any choice. Making a choice to them is like pulling the slot machine lever. And so it never gets boring. That's the mentality of that kind of person. 
Now, you might say, well, it sounds like it would be really good to be that kind of person, because the world would be so much more interesting. You might say that this makes it seem like being dumb is more fun, but it isn't. Some people are psychologically constituted such that they enjoy injuring themselves, but a pleasure that is inimical to life won't be a pleasure for very long. So you have to make sure that the kinds of joy you're getting are consonant with survival. That's the only way you'll be happy in the long run anyway. It's not just that if you have pleasures that make you dumber or less able to survive, you'll have less time to be alive and therefore less pleasure, but happiness is non-contradictory joy. You'll never even be happy if you have pleasures that contradict each other and contradict life. So you have to have an integrated whole all your pleasures have to be derived from life and aimed at the achievement of life in a non-contradictory way. That's the only way you will get that exalted state called happiness. So don't envy the dummies who have the dog mentality. So I'm not sure how long I've been talking. It seemed pretty short. But, you know, one of the problems with this is that I see someone say something stupid and I get all fired up. And I will just talk for hours to myself, just go on and on and on to an imaginary audience. Now, when I try to do this into the mic to be recorded like I'm doing now, it's a bit colder. I didn't just come off being outraged by some imbecile. So what I may do to solve that problem is just record from my phone. It will probably sound a little more tinny, but you'll get more content, more passionate content that way. So. If you want me to try that out, I may. So, as for this episode, to sum up, presentations of morality are interesting only when they're actionable. And so far from being simplistic, binary moral choice systems bring in vast amounts of data, and their prescriptions are actionable because of it. It's the cult of disintegration and the worship of case-by-caseism that's oversimplified. Binary moral choice systems are the only moral choice systems worth caring about if you want moral insight and guidance, and to be trained in integration, even if the moral views of the author are wrong, which is part of the value of art. Even if you get a piece of art that makes a statement you disagree with, like Jurassic Park, in my view, you still get training in viewing the world in an integrated way, so... You don't have to agree with an artwork for it to be valuable. It, it helps make you a smarter person, a better thinker. And it's just pleasurable in its own right, because it teaches you to think of the world as being coherent, as being rational, logical. And it's nice to see the world that way, because it has implications for your success. If the world is intelligible, you can predict the future and act in a way such that you can expect success. So art like that, still great, still recommend it. So that's the end of this episode. Let me know what you thought. If you liked my greater authenticity and probably greater stiltedness this time, I don't know what the trade-off is. I don't know what you prefer. Let me know. I can go back and forth, but that's it for this episode. And I'll tell you about everything else, like usual, after that little warp sound. If you have any questions about anything I talked about today, just send me an email at charles.a.2 at gmail.com. You can also check out my website at charles2.com. There you can find information on and links to everything I do, including ways to support it. The biggest way you can support me is by going to patreon.com slash charles2 and becoming a contributor. I have rewards for our all different levels of support, including one-on-one -on -one tutoring, if you support me at a certain level. Aside from that, you can leave reviews for the podcast wherever you happen to listen to it, such as iTunes, and any of those things make a big difference, including reviews, so don't discount those. If you have a couple minutes to spare and you like this podcast, consider leaving a brief review. Thanks for listening. Let's meet again in episode 10. <laughs>